Well, thank you, and uh, thank all of you who have taken the time to be with us today. And, and, and by the way, I want to send a very special thanks to Holly Rotundi, who is the executive director of the Friends of the World War II uh, Memorial. Uh, for to Holly, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, educational experience. Look, moreover, I stand before you today representing the United States Merchant Marine and the veterans of World War II. I'm here to honor those who are living and those who have passed over the bar who have died who represent a glorious and heroic contribution to the efforts and the ultimate success of our country's participation in that great war. On December 7, 1941, we were as a nation 130 million people versus the 325 million plus that we have today. And we were drawn into World War II after an attack by the Japanese. December 7th. Several days after that brutal attack, Germany and its allies also declared war on us. And this begins our story. And thus the identification which we have been labeled the greatest generation. By war's end, almost four years later, we had produced a fighting force of 16 million men and women out of this population, which represented 12.5% of our population. And as an aftermath, 440,000 of us died. And an untold number came home, wounded in body and in spirit. In December of 1941, I was 13 years of age. And by the time 1944 came around, I was close to 15 years of age. And I was, at that time, making a decision, as did many others in my same classification, about being part of the military service. First, I chose the United States Navy. I forged the birth certificate, went down past the physical, and was about to be indoctrinated and shipped off to training camp. And the police showed up in my house and told my mother and father that I was a truant and I was only 15 and I had falsified. Uh, you can imagine it didn't go over to go with my parents, but I had made the decision. So I followed up by enlisting in the U.S. Maritime Service, U.S. Merchant Marine. Two things, two separate bodies, same purpose. Now in today's parlance, the response is usually, well, who are the Merchant Marines? And what in God's name is the U.S. Maritime Service? And what did they do in World War II? The Merchant Marine has been in existence in this country since the Revolutionary War. World War II was the only war engaged in by the United States whereby the Merchant Marine was allocated through government decisions to the all-dominant purpose of supporting the Army and the Navy. World War II is the sole example of our nation's history where the Merchant Marine was placed under naval discipline and among other regulations prohibited the ship's captains and or the crew from surrendering their vessel to the enemy. First time. A major part of Merchant Marine history in World War II occurred prior to that, 1936. 1936, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our president at that time, passed the Merchant Marine Act which identified the need for cargo ships, tankers, and troop transports, together with appropriate means to recruit and train and manage the Merchant Marines as he wanted it to be, and as an adjunct arm of our military. What followed is now our history of the Merchant Marine in World War II. The first thing they established was the United States Maritime Service, which exists today, is under the supervision of the Department of Transportation. Unlike wartime, we were in the direct direction, if that's repeating myself, of the U.S. Coast Guard and the United States Navy. They opened in Kings Point, New York. Kings Point Academy is one of today one of the most revered educational centers, and it is the same academy 
as the Naval Academy or the Army uh, West Point. And so we have that training center. And if you look us up, you'll find some unique things about it which exist today. For basic training for the non-officers, they opened uh, training centers in Florida, one in California, and one in Sheepshead Bay on the East Coast. Sheepshead Bay is near Brooklyn, New York. They also had training schools for radio officers, and the training center that I remember the most is Hoffman Island, New York. They also intended to expand the merchant fleet, and they were going to build 1,500, I repeat, 1,500 new ships. Now remember, we were in the war, but the war is being fought elsewhere, as you will see. And they were recruiting men 18 years and up in that period of time when that maritime service, the U.S. Merchant Marine, was established. But they needed more and more men, as you will see, to man these ships. And so they dropped the age to 16 years. 16 years, 16 year old men. Something wrong with the statement. It just doesn't ring that a 16 year old, you're a man. But let's see what happens. We were all volunteers. Most of us didn't seek a career. We saw it as a patriot art. 250,000 of us recruited. Less than 1,800 of us are still alive. Now, if you say that, it rolls easily. It is my hope that with God's direction, I speak for those 248,200 lives that are no longer alive and those who are still alive less than 1,800 out of the 250,000 recruited. February 1942, the Navy issued instructions addressed to the merchant marine captains and armed guard gunnery. Now they put on the ships eventually armed guard, they manned them with guns, and they had specially trained people in the Navy. That's a separate division of the Navy. Look it up. Revered people, the armed guard and their officers. These orders remove what had been, up to this point, a policy of defensive posture, means you didn't fire unless you were fired upon. They changed that. The gunnery orders of February 1942 read as follows. There is no situation where either the captain or armed guard commander should delay opening fire on an enemy. In that same year, Fleet Admiral Ernest J. King, Chief of Naval Operations, sent a message to all U.S. naval units that henceforth naval discipline and control were to be exercised against any merchant marine crew or crewmen in all theaters of war. In short, like all the other services, merchant mariners were subject to court-martial and penalties for failure to follow the directive of the U.S. Navy. Sometime later you'll hear how that was corrupted. But let's see some of the hurdles that we, our government was facing and what we were called upon to support. The U.S. fought on five, count them, five continents, that's all we have in the world, five continents. We fought in all five of those continents. We were at war, all the wars were fought elsewhere. We were manufacturing goods to take to these major combat areas. And we, the U.S. Merchant Marine, served all these areas. World War II, however, was a combination of industrial production. The Japanese made a severe mistake on December 7th. They never took into consideration several things. They left our oil fields in, in the Hawaiian Islands. They never blew them up. They never thought about that. They didn't get the biggest part of our Navy. And third, they never counted on a country that would become so uh, militarize so rapidly and do the things that we were about to do. Now, Liberty ships, we decided to create a new kind of ships and this was just prior to World War II. They were called Liberty ships. Only two of them still around today. But these ships were really uh, great, great space vehicles. They had tons and tons of areas. They could only go eight or nine knots, say eight or nine miles an hour on the water with a full load. We built um, 3,000 vessels totally, and among them was this great ship. And if you think about that, if we built that many, they were building one a day, less than maybe six a week. 
Now, I'll tell you this, that uh, in all truth, nothing is without fault. Grievous things happen because we don't plan them all. But what did happen? We lost 200 of those Liberty ships. And there were many other types of ships. There were tankers and there were uh, uh, transportation ships for crews to, to take crews to the position. So they converted cargo ships to be crew, troop ships, troop ships. So uh, now we're ready to go to all destinations. Now let me define you what all destinations are and what we did. These are the historical records. We made and delivered 15 million tons of supplies, food, ammunition, fuel, 15 million tons to Great Britain and Europe. Another 13 million tons we delivered to the Pacific. Another 8 million tons to the Mediterranean. And we delivered 5 million tons to our ally Russia, who was a lead ally. And if you remember when the war ended, we were at odds with them because of the Cold War. Plus all these things that we delivered we delivered 7 million military personnel to combat or staging areas and then returned them after the war because President Truman, then president at the end of the war, asked us to do so. We did what we were asked to do, and here's one of the saddest statistics you will ever read. I'm talking about my brother. We had the highest casualty rate of any branch of the service. One out of every 26 of us died. Thousands more came home physically and emotionally scarred for the rest of their life. Those serving on tankers, of which I was one, and served in an engine room, of which I was one, had a particular story. They were a plum for the group that would attack us. If you could sink a tanker, you not only sank a ship, but you sank the ability for other ships to move, tanks to move, uh, diesels uh, to move, uh, anything that needed fuel, aircraft, uh, jeeps, tanks, whatever. We needed that fuel, so if the enemy could sink one of those. Now, uh, with all this, 663 of us, 663 merchant seamen, were captured and held as prisoners of war. If you're in the military, you get pay, your pay goes on. But if you were in the merchant marine through a loophole, it did not go on. We were given $1 a day. So someone I know very well spent over three years in a prison camp when he got home, got a check for slightly under $1,100 to pay you for almost three years of your life service. Through an oversight, we were also excluded from the GI Bill which came out in the early part of the war. And we were excluded. It was unfortunate. They, were, they tried to resurface it and whatnot. But the thing that made America great is the uh, veteran came home and could have enough money to buy a house, get an education, pay for medical bills. And it all made very easy. The GI Bill made it very easy. Your parents, your grandparents, or their parents might have been able to accept that. We didn't get that. We got it later, as you will see. We come home with common lifetime ailments. I'm an example. Now, if you look at me and hear me, you may not think I'm 93 years old. I was 15 when I went in. I have malaria. I caught it in, the, in, the, in, the, in Saipan, uh, in the Pacific Islands. They treated me with adabrine and they treated me with quinine but it resurfaced after the war. So I had to be treated for malaria at my own expense, and I can no longer give blood. I cannot give a transfusion because that thing stays in my system. I had ulcers at 16 years of age. I came home with ulcers, wasn't diagnosed and sent to a medical hospital that was run by the government. I paid for that. And at the age of 62, a renowned physician determined that I didn't have ulcers all the time. I had something called, those of you in the medical profession would recognize it, H. pylori, which means I had an infection in my system. And they cured, at 62, they cured it. And then 
we have something called asbestosis because I worked in the engine room. The pipes in the engine room were covered with asbestos. And so I have asbestosis. And fortunately for me, probably because of my lifestyle, I have asbestosis coating my lungs, which became plated. Something in my system covered those. That's what the physicians tell me. But finally, the main unnamed disease that a high percentage of combat veterans faced, and we don't want to talk about it, is something called post-traumatic stress. But that's not its real name. It's post-traumatic stress disorder. And over one million hospital beds were filled after the war with people who had that, and no one wanted to admit they had it because of the word disorder, and it could contaminate employment later, and even your social prestige. We also paid taxes, by the way, on everything we earned. The average military guy got a $1,500 deduction. I'm not crying in pain. I don't dislike anybody. I don't dislike my government. I love my government. I love my country. I don't like the way it's run at times. They make mistakes, we pay for it. In 1988, 43 years after the war ended, we were granted the Bill of Rights, and the reason I'm laughing if your GI Bill, uh, not the Bill of Rights, the GI Bill in 1988, because 43 years later, after the war, don't forget, I came out at 17, that means I was 60. By then, if you hadn't made enough to take care of yourself, you were in real trouble in this country. 75 years after World War II also, they are issuing us a great, great honor. They issued upon us in 2000, though we haven't gotten the medal yet, the Congressional, the Congressional Gold Medal for our efforts have yet to be received. In about five days, I'm going to be speaking to the Convention of the United States Merchant Marine, U.S. Maritime Service, and the Armed Guard, and I'll be speaking at that convention. And they will be receiving a copy of what it looks like, and sometime soon thereafter, we will receive that gold medal. In the early years of letter writing to the Congress, because a lot of people took up our case and said, this isn't fair, this isn't right. I can't go through my life, I can't speak for others, just saying, well, it was wrong and I can't live and because I didn't get this, I didn't get that, I can't succeed. I have done very well in my life. If you know about me or look me up on YouTube, Dave Yoho, you will see that I've done very well in my life. But I did pen a part of that letter that went to Congress. And here's where I said to the Congress of the United States, do you, can you, will you ever understand that we gave up our youth when we held up our hands and swore to do what we were asked to do? And then at the bottom of this, I wrote about our letters continue to come in. I said these epitaphs, I trust it will not offend you. Hell no! We won't go away. If you have ever seen the movie, Saving Private Ryan, you see an epitome of what I'm going to be talking about. In that movie, there's a very poignant scene that happens in a burial, a seminary, a, a cemetery, I should say, in, uh, in Europe, in France. And there's an old man kneeling before a cross, searching for a name. It is supposedly the uh, uh, Private Ryan of today who survived all the years. And he kneels and tearfully he says, did what we did count? Did what I did, what I was asked to do, was I worthy? Can you tell me I was, and yet the unspoken words, if you have friends who are veterans, not only of the merchant marines, anyone, they don't want to talk about it. Get it out of the way and move on. Whatever was wrong was wrong. I want to take you to what we call the second Pearl Harbor in the Merchant Marines. It happened December 2nd, 1943 in Bari, Italy. This is uh, in the uh, Adriatic side of Italy, a beautiful, beautiful little country spot today. But in uh, 1943, it was a harbor where ships brought in tools and armament and clothing and whatnot and because it was 43 and the war would go on for, don't forget, almost two more years. But in December of 1943, 
There was a ship in that harbor that was carrying explosives that were unnamed at the time by General Bernard Montgomery, of some fame if you saw the movie Patton. He requisitioned these bombs. And one of them, one of these ships, the USS John Harvey, carried 100 tons of mustard gas bombs. Although outlawed after World War I, in the American logic, we were never to use mustard gas. General Montgomery requisitioned these to be made in our country and shipped to him on the ship in case the Germans, who he was fighting, would take advantage of us and use germ warfare. 100 tons of mustard gas bomb. At about 3.30 in the afternoon, that port, having 30 ships in the harbor, look at my hands, normally when you see ships line up to unload, they line up right next to the dock. This harbor was so loaded, they docked this way. There were 30 ships in that harbor, and only one of them had this on it. And when those German planes came in, whether they knew it or not, they dropped a bomb on the SS John Harvey, which exploded. No, no, not exploded. It disintegrated. With 100,000 tons inside of a combustible material, it exploded, taking down the two ships, one on each side. At the end of the day, 1,000 military, including U.S. allies and merchant marine seamen, were killed on that first day. And then a cloud of smoke rises out of this, so like a fog, and it's orange in color, and it's mustard gas. It defeats your ability to breathe. Now, there was a total of 17 Allied ships that were sunk that afternoon at that 3 p.m. Eight burned in such an existence that they could nothing could be recovered on them. And why haven't you heard about it? Because in the wisdom of our government at that time, they said, it's not a good thing for people to know. It'll take down their morale. And I don't judge them on that. Their thought was probably right. Maybe it would have. But I do tell you it happened, and you can find out about it today. Look it up. Barry, December 1943. We call it the invasion, Barry, and we call it Second Pearl Harbor. And I'll leave you with one more thought before I go. I want to tell you about something called Murmansk. If you have the, ever the opportunity to do so, please visit the World War II Memorial. It's a sacred place for me and my friends, but it's also a sacred place for you. It holds our history. And on one side of the area, it lists all the great battlefronts, and on, you'll see it etched in stone. Look for the one that says Murmansk. Murmansk is in a part of Russia that's very close to the Barents Sea. And if you look at that, here's Russia, Here's the Barents Sea, and over here at the Scandinavian Peninsula, directly over here, Norway. Norway was owned and controlled by the Germans at that time. They defeated the Norwegian government, and they occupied the country. And they had housed in the harbor there some of the great battles, uh, the great ships. One of them is called the Tirpitz. Late June 1942, we had only been in the war seven months. And after the war started, we recognized the need to ship goods there. And they put together the largest convoy in American history. Tell me how many of your schools, university, are going to tell you what I tell you now. No condemnation, fact. They had a billion dollars worth of material. Now, that part of the center, that's about $5 million. Burned for my bound for Mur 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 uh, Murmansk, M-U-R-M-A-N-S-K-S, Murmansk, Russia. 35 merchant ships, 24 military ships, including cruisers and escorts and destroyers, uh, air support, submarines, and cargoes containing 300 aircraft, 600 tanks, 4,000 trucks, 1,000 jeeps, and 150 tons of general cargo. Uh, what happened was the Barents Sea is a treacherous place to be to begin with. The German fleet was in Oslo, as I mentioned, Oslo, Norway. 
They have water temperature in that area of 45 degrees below zero. 45 degrees below zero. You hit the water, you got four or five minutes, and you're, and you're done. Hypothermia take. Hurricane winds creating waves 60 to 70 foot high. You can look this up and you'll see portrayals of this and you'll see the ships, they have pictures of the ships coated with ice and the men out there with, with hatchets chopping the ice to keep the ship mobile. There was an admiral in, uh, in UK, in, in what is today Great Britain, United Kingdom, and that admiral had charge of that part of the uh, war space. And although we were in Russian water and American ships, he was in charge. And on the belief that that Tirpitz, the ship I mentioned, which was the, uh, the largest, most effective battleship uh, in the world, was housed there. And in the belief that that was going to come out and attack ships, Admiral Pound ordered all of the support away from this convoy. All of the support. So within a matter of hours and five days from the port where they were sailing to, this convoy was condemned to death. 34 ships, 11, count them, 11 ships get through. The rest are sunk. Young sailors thrown in the water. I told you, you can make it four or five minutes. And the ships can't stop. They can't shop to pick you up. And in the end, 120 U.S. and Allied merchantmen died. Most were killed immediately when they hit the water. Those that survived came home crippled, maimed, maimed, and emotionally scarred for life. It remains one of the saddest and shameless episodes, shameful episodes of the war. But again, no repudiation. We are dealing with human beings who sometimes are. Now, when that war ended, I was in the Pacific Ocean. I was on a ship that was destined to be at the invasion of Okinawa. I was on a tanker. We refueled other ship. It was often called a fleet oiler. When that war ended, August 15, 1947, four days later, I became 17 years of age. People ask me, what was it like to be a kid? We weren't kids. We were kids when we went in. But the day you go in and the day you go on duty, instant maturity, because if you're not a man, you don't make it. You don't cut it. You can't get to it. And I often weep as I think of these young men, my brothers, my friends, my associates, veterans, who hit that water and knew they were going to die. They weren't going to make it. And this is why we so revere this great country of ours. It is a great country. No matter what people do to destroy it or say about it, this is still the greatest country in the world. Do they make mistakes? It's natural, normal to make mistakes. Now, I would hope that you carry with you something from my message. I bear no, no ill feelings for what was done to us in that service. They did try to make reference for, to it and make reprimand. And hopefully it suits well the position of those who are still alive. I am going to be speaking five days from now in Lithicum, Maryland, to the American Merchant Marine Convention. The Armed Guard will be there, as will the U.S. Maritime Service. I'm going to be there because they are honoring us with the dedication of the medal which we are soon to receive, the Congressional Gold Medal. And I salute my brothers, my sisters in arms. I say if you are moved in any way by what I've told you, I ask you to find about the American Merchant, Merchant, Merchant Marine. They're our voice. They have kept us alive. And they're a small organization because we keep dying on them and there's not enough members left. And so as I wrap this up, I will say, do you have any questions? I will answer most of those except those dealing with my age or virility. But I am 93 and the other I won't comment on. But my final words are this. When you are with others, will you tell them about us? 
where you ask them to visit the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., or if some distance away, tune in to find out what went on in our lives. And then say to whoever you're talking to, a reminder, we gave up our yesterdays for their tomorrows. God bless the United States of America, and God bless you for tuning in today.